welcome everyone for our November session of AZ Bio Peers. Um, today we have Michelle Lott, um, principal and founder of Lean RAQA, who is going to be talking about successful go-to-market strategies and how to assess EU and US markets. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Joan. Um, so to give you guys a little context, Lean RQA specializes in doing regulatory strategy for US and EU from like the FDA or the notified body regulator perspective. Um, and so this presentation is kind of a mix of how do all the changing regulations in Europe right now affect your business strategy? Um, so that's a little bit of context around it. It's not just a straight market analysis. So I'm Michelle, I have been in the regulated life science space for over 20 years in regulatory and quality roles. Um, I also served a four year term on an FDA advisory committee and recently was part of a team that did uh, the, the assessments for the NIH TABA program. Um, this is my executive team. They are quite the taskmasters. Um, but you can tell we, we have we have fun with it. So today we're going to talk about the current picture in the EU um, what the political landscape uh, and how that impacts your strategy um, and the differences between bring, commercializing a product in the US versus the EU uh, and then how to use regulatory as competitive advantage in all of uh, in, in this changing political landscape. And then we're going to close with how do you walk through and make that business case for the MDR? So currently in the EU, the regulations are changing so much that um, I make this joke. So you want to send your, pro your, your product to Europe, but you don't want to send it on the National Lampoon's uh, European vacation, which is what it feels like to uh, ne go negotiate through the MDR with a notified body. So recently with, with the MDR, which went into effect May of this year, it effectively changed the whole paradigm of bringing a product to market. Previously under the MDD or the Medical Device Directive, uh, Europe had a reputation for being easier to get your product to market, uh, less negotiations with the notified body and fewer clinical trials, whereas the FDA was heavily reliant on clinical trials and wasn't very um, negotiable. Well, uh, for under the MDR, all of the, that uh, paradigm has totally shifted, and now Europe has got excessive requirements for clinical trials. So if you're not familiar with the difference between the MDD and the MDR, the MDD was only 60 pages with 23 articles and 12 annexes. But the um, MDR, is 175 pages with 101 whereas is 71 definitions and now we're up to 123 articles so just the sheer magnitude i said the mdd is like cutting down a tree uh to to print it and read it whereas the mdr with all of its uh pages plus the guidance documents that they're giving out to try to explain how to do it um, you know, is more like cutting down a forest to print. Um, and this isn't just about uh, the changing regulations in Europe, but also the FDA uh, had a, a priority, um, strategic priority that they published in 2018 that said by December 31st in 2020, that they wanted more than 50% of manufacturers of novel technologies to bring their product to the US market first or in parallel with other major markets. So you've got two, you've got the FDA trying to uh, deliberately be uh, the first for novel devices, whereas the MDR is making it to where novel devices are gonna be extremely difficult to bring to market. So there, there's shifts on both sides of, of the, the regulations here. And so right now, the just the diversity in Europe and what's happening politically is extremely complex. 
not only do you have the 27 member countries to negotiate, you've also got the, the free trade um, group that is uh, informally a part of Europe. You've got uh, Brexit, which just uh, affected the UK and Northern Ireland. So now the first group, um, you know, applies a normal CE mark that goes through a particular process. But now in Great Britain, you've got the UK CA mark. And in Northern Ireland, you've got the, the UK NI CE mark. And all three of these have different ways to bring your product to market, different governing bodies. And then we've got uh, the, you know, nobody's really sure what's uh, going to end up with Switzerland and Turkey and Turkcic. So needless to say, this is a very complicated political picture right now. But from a medical device perspective, it's extremely complicated to figure out what pathway applies to your product now in what country. Um, so another problem is that the medical device regulation was negotiated and written in English, um, and then it was translated into the other 23 languages that are recognized in, as member states. Well, for some of us, this might as well have been written in Klingon um, because there are so many translation issues going from language to language and just the implication in the way they, they swap sentence structures. So that has left, and this was a notified body that actually said this to me, that the interpretation differences are so significant that it's not clear, it's not legislation, it's just interpretation at this point because all of this is so new, nobody understands what the expectations are. So does MDR really bring more harmonization? Um, that was the, the original goal. Uh, but there are differences in the application submission process between the notified bodies. There are differences in fees, cultural differences based on and language based on where the notified body is located, um, and then expertise differences. It's extremely hard to get the appropriately qualified resources at the notified bodies. So this has really led to you know you've got the faith phrase, you know, everything rolls downhill. Well, the European Commission, you know, is pushing the regulation down to the, and their interpretation down to the national competent authorities. The competent authorities are responsible for um, qualifying and auditing the notified bodies. And then that's just led this snowball to where manufacturers are going to have extremely hard time keeping their, uh, their product marketed in Europe. So the reduction of notified bodies um, is so significant that we're down to just 24 that have been designated and made it all the way through the process. And as of October this year, this is the, the data for the number of notified bodies who are in queue to get designated. And this process takes a very long time. And you can see at best, we've only got two that, that are coming up through the final stages of, of qualification to make it into the NANDO database. Um, and so resources are extremely limited right now in the number of notified bodies that can, um, can certify products. So the difference in the e US versus the EU commercialization. In the US, the FDA is the FDA. It is the only agency that you have to think about and negotiate with um, for all 50 states in our territories. Um, however, in the EU, the notified bodies are the reviewers of your technical documentation. And once they issue the CE mark, they are now responsible for your technical documentation and have to defend your documentation, your product, and their authorization of it to the national competent authorities if there is a problem. Well, the problem, and so another complication is, is that for the national competent authorities, you've got more than one competent authority per member state. So that's like having, you know, 30 different FDAs that you have to negotiate with. Whereas with FDA, this is a range marriage. The only way you're going to get your product to market in the U.S. is talk to the one and the only FDA. 
So notified bodies, it's extremely complicated to even know how to uh, select one. And it's much more like um, dating on Tinder than uh, going to uh, the courthouse to get married to your one and only FDA. So there's a whole series of questions you need to ask a notified body to know if they're even properly qualified to um, designate your product. Another uh, compare and contrast is the way you get your pro this is the submission process on the left with how to bring your product to market with FDA. It's pretty much a linear approach. You know what to expect in terms of timeline, um, you know, kind of plus or minus. Um, and it's a one way street. You get your product to market and you only have to go back through that 510K process if you make a change to your product that requires a new 510K. Um, and there's very little required in terms of post market. To where the one on the right is an actual flow chart from a notified body of what it's like to walk through and what you can expect at different phases. So you can see you've got a pre-application, application, initial certification. You've got, uh, then you have to maintain your certification and get it renewed. So you really stay in this perpetual motion machine um, in terms of uh, your product clearance and certification. So in the US, there are basically, you know, four paths to market, and they can range from being as easy as like a walk in the park to training and finishing uh, in Ironman. In the EU, you've got several different types. You've got one set of documents called your technical documentation. And to a point, it's going to, you know, your class ones aren't going to require um, nearly as a stringent oversight, but you do have to have a European authorized representative that will audit your tech technical documentation as well, even, even for just a class one general product. Um, class 1s and 1r you have to have a notified body of those sterile reusable measuring features and then your 2a 2b and class 3 are going to require a full out notified body review and while the level of documentation is going to be different the stringency in which a class 2a is audited now is is to the same standard and the same checklist as a class 3s um, and then for your 2Bs, uh, so, uh, certain types of your 2Bs and class 3s, they're going to also have to go through an uh, expert panel that is outside of your notified body. To, and the expert panel is going to review your clinical data and they have to concur with your notified body um, on the, the determination of the safety of your product. There's much more emphasis on post market now. Um, you can see like the work that you did to bring your mark product to market. You're going to have to do that much work after your products on market uh, in terms of your your post market surveillance and clinical data. So if we take a look at uh, regulatory as a competitive advantage, um, you know, as investors, you know, I think uh, especially in life science spaces where the investor may or may not have a particular background. Um, they, they, they think that the company has a great pitch, that their financial projections look great. The concept makes sense. They've got a market fit. And the company is confident in their regulatory strategy, even though they did all the research themselves. So if you think that those ch just checking those boxes is uh, gonna make a sound investment, that's, that's just fair, very wrong. If in a pitch you hear the words novel and first of its kind and new technology, that is not equal to a 510K. If they are telling you and our regulatory strategy is we're going to do a 510K, those words are triggers for the FDA because 510K is based off of a principle called substantial equivalence, which means you are not novel. You are nearly equivalent or identical to a product that's already on the market. Uh, I also, also see uh, in startup companies doing too little too late. They have their idea. They think they have their market validated. Um, so these are all the typical steps to commercializing a product. This is where a lot of people call me. We need it now. We're ready for you to write a 510K. 
But the problem is, is, and they don't call me until like the last minute because they think regulatory sounds expensive. However, this is when um, you should get a regulatory strategy is at that point between your idea and your market validation because your regulatory strategy is gonna affect your test strategy, your budget and your timeline. And you need your test strategy in place before you have your first prototype because the FDA is gonna expect to see that what you did your testing on is, so is equivalent, production equivalent to what you're gonna commercialize. You need your design controls during all of this process because if not, you have to, then, then you get need your full QMS as you're going through your clearance and approval. And then what happens if you don't do those things at the right time, you have to get in your time machine and build your quality management system, your design controls, your testing all retrospectively. And this really is expensive. So how do we make a business case for the MDR? Well, you have to make a, a product portfolio rationalization. For some of your products, you're gonna immediately know it's just not worth it. Some of them you're gonna be like, why would I bother? Um, but for some of those products that you may not be sure about, is does the product have an existing, uh, is there existing product on the market that's similar, that you have? You can use your existing five-year growth plan um, to project those. That's pretty straightforward. Whereas if, there, if you don't have an existing product and this is your initial in, uh, entry, then you start having to get more speculative. Are there competitors out there? If yes, what percent of the market share do you think you can get for potential new for potential new products? If there's no competitor out there, then you're going to need extensive clinical data to um, to project what is what could be your model, like in terms of what are the adverse events that are happening and the cost to the healthcare environment that you could prevent. What is the unmet need? Uh, what is the improvement to the procedure or process that you're going to make? And you have to use all of that to model what revenue you anticipate. It's extremely important to know your cost and hypothesis over time, particularly for the EU. You're going to have a lot of ongoing updates in terms of keeping your quality management system uh updated as these new guidance documents come out from the mdcg you're going to have third-party fees as we saw in the complicated picture you're going to have a european authorized representative a swiss authorized representative a uk authorized representative you're going to have a notified body all of those and your notified body is going to have to audit you for your quality system certification and audit your critical suppliers um, so these costs can get, uh, you know, quite pricey in just external fees. Um, and as new standards come out, you're going to also have to update your, your testing as you, as you um, go. Your product has to stay living. Um, and then you have to know what your hypothesis are. You know, typical year one for a new product, you can anticipate about half a percent of the market. And then the EU is also uh, tender based meaning that uh, that you can only um, submit to certain healthcare markets on a, like a, a, when they open what's called a tender and usually those are on three year cycles. And so I, it's taking about a year and a half to negotiate an MDR designation. So from a marketing perspective, it's extremely hard to know when you can enter, uh, when, when you will have your designation, designation to even be able to submit for a tender. And it's entirely possible that by the time you make it through the designation process, depending on where the tender cycle is, you may have just missed the tender cycle and have to wait on the next one. Well, in that period of time, your certificate could, is up for renewal as well, and you haven't even been able to enter the market yet. So there's a lot of things to think about here in terms of tender timing um, and, and cycles for all these things. So if we look at, at the contrast in the way of communicating and the cost uh, between the FDA and the notified bodies, is that you know the these are just a, a handful of the types of 
a pre-submission review that you can go through with the FDA on the left. And most all of these are free. Um, and the FDA is very collaborative. There's no, uh, I know companies that have had, you know, two and three pre-subs just to engage with the agency prior to um, submission. And then during review, the FDA fees, particularly if you qualify as a small business, are, are very small in comparison to what a notified body's fees are. Um, and just to get in the op application process right now is extremely difficult. You're gonna be knocking on a lot of doors. A lot of notified bodies are not even taking um, new, new clients right now, or they're telling you that they're a year away from having resources to support your product. And there is no such thing as a, a pre-submission where they just it, it freely engage with you. Um, so then their fees, you know, go up exponentially for each round of the review that you go through. Um, I know of a company who uh, went through a year's worth of reviews. Um, they kept getting new reviewers and then the new reviewers, instead of just auditing the questions that were asked previously, just redid the whole assessment and came up with all new questions on top. And so they, and then they were, after a year, still didn't have their sterility and biocompatibility queries. So at this point, the company had spent $100,000 just in third party notified body fees, and they withdrew the application because they had no idea how much longer it was going to be and how many more queries they, they were going to get. So companies really have to make ask themselves, does MDR make sense or are they going to go bust in the regulatory review process? So to help um, with navigate both of these uh, avenues, because you really have to understand your regulatory pathway and your business market assessment at the same time, those things work together to do a market analysis um, in, in the EU right now. And so I've created two tools to help on both sides of that, um, that you can go to the website and download um, the regulatory pathway assessment and my business market assessment. So with that, I'll take uh, any questions now, Joan. I'm back. Thank you so much. That was terrific, Michelle. So, um, you and I were talking before the audience joined us today, and for so long, people used to say, oh, it's so hard to get through the FDA. I'm going and getting my CE mark in Europe first. When did all of that start to change? Well, the MDR was published in 2017, and what it did was it gathered up like all of these guidance documents and you know it's, it's classic manufacturers always say oh that's a guidance document it's voluntary i don't have to do it well it was things that that the competent authorities had been expecting all along so they really just codified some of those guidance documents that they expected manufacturers to be doing um and so as when mdr came out in notified bodies were gradually being held to a higher standard, even though it didn't go into effect immediately. It, it went into effect informally, if you will. Um, so it had been easing since 2017, you know, mar the market had been pushed, the notified bodies had been pushed towards that level of compliance. And um, does Europe still have the repertoire system countries that kind of lead that regulatory process? No, well, I'm, I'm not sure what that word is, repertoire. Well, I, I think, um, and um, Jim, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were certain companies, countries like Germany and the EU and France that were the leads and normally if you you know started to get through that process you were going to do that can a company just go to certain countries 
in Europe and get approval, or do they have to go across the whole gambit? The it's the whole gambit and you need, but it does make a difference what notified body you select and where they're based because there will be language differences and cultural differences and you need to understand and, and interpretation of the actual regulation. It, it varies so widely that like a German notified body has to do at least some portion of their audit on site where the ones from the Netherlands allow fully remote. So, so there's like little differences like that. So, so we were talking, you know, in your, your graphics, you showed the medical devices. And um, so how does the, your, how do the European bodies look at laboratory developed tests? Are the LDTs, you know, where do they sit? Yep. So the LDTs are going to be more underneath the IVDR than the MDR. Uh, which is a separate set of regulations that came out um, kind of at the same time. And the IVDR went from only 20% of the products needed to go through notified body to 80% of the products under MDR. So 20% had notified body oversight in um, MDD or the ID, IVD. And then under IVDR now 80% are going to need a notified body oversight and right now there are only six notified bodies that are designated to be able to um, audit to the IVDR. Okay. So this is where you, you know regulatory strategy where you have to under, really understand the product classification what rules apply and what loopholes you have. So that regulatory strategy works hand in hand with the business market assessment. So as we, um, you know, come back to Arizona, all right? So now I'm a startup and I have a medical device and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to complete my development cycle. I'm going, trying to figure out how I'm going to do my market strategy. I've downloaded these tools. I start to walk through the process and I get stuck. I don't have some of these answers. Mm -hmm. Where can I go for help? Um, you can come to me. You know, I, cre I created the tools. I know how to use them. Um, and most people like, the tools are supposed to help guide you of all the things that you need to think about, but your depth of knowledge likely isn't there to, to fully complete the, the market assessment. But at least you're not going to go in um, blind or unknowing about the things that you need to think about. But I, uh, this is usually where I start a project is with one or the other of these tools, depending on where the client's at and understanding their market fit. Um, and then we, we map out the whole, re ideally I get involved early in concept development and we map out that whole strategy from, from end to end on product commercialization. Okay, so you say that whole strategy from end to end. You know, if I have a 510K and it truly fits the 510K model in the US, pre-COVID, about how long did that take? Pre-COVID, the FDA was doing pretty well um, for, for things that were just kind of straight predicate comparisons for substantial equivalence, uh, was doing pretty well at 90 days, just over that. Um, if you had some novel features where you had used a reference device or had to do some, some different kind of testing, um, you know, I think those were running a little bit more around um, five to 10 months. Okay. And then came COVID. Yep. So um, that, you know, for, for just pre-submissions, the FDA uh, stopped taking them months ago. They, 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 you get a form letter now that says, thanks, but no thanks, we're kind of busy. And um, if you really want us to look at this, then resubmit it and, if we review it, it will be 120 to 180 days. Okay. Yeah. And so, well, since FDA is 
not even going to look at it and I'm going to go across the pond. How long is that going to take? Mm -hmm. Well, just to get a quote from a notified body, I know one part, one of my clients spent six months just negotiating the, the quote and the contract with the notified body. Um, another client that actually was one of the first adopters, um, because they're based in Switzerland, they, uh, it took them a year and a half from the time they turned their technical documentation in to the time that they made it through the certification process. And you have to know the certification process is you've two parts. You've got the audit from the notified body, and then they have to negotiate with a competent authority to issue the certificate. So just the assessment took a year and to get the certificate took another six months. Okay, so now I'm gonna put my investor hat on. So I'm sitting in a Desert Angels meeting or an ATI meeting and you know, companies are saying, okay, this is my timeline to revenue. If these numbers aren't right, um, yep. that's going to really impact my exit timeline. Right. And that's why I've got this regulatory and the market in the same presentation, because I'm really passionate that investors have to ask these questions. They can't just, it, it, that should be a red flag to you. And just the little bit you learned in this presentation, if now if you're sitting in somebody in a pitch tells you, I'm going to go to Europe first. That should be like red flags and bells and whistles going off that they, they don't understand the, the changing landscape right now. Okay. What about, um, you know, we've talked about the U.S. and the U.K., you know, Brazil's a giant market. What about, okay, well, maybe I'll go there. Um, they all have their, their different types of submission processes. Um, Brazil, I, I haven't done any product there lately, but they, they are notorious for taking a really long time and then being inconsistent with, um, like some of the questions and requirements really aren't coming from a regulation, but more of an opinion of the reviewer. Um, and then you also have to ha go through the Metasap process or medical device single audit program to get a certi certification for your quality system before you, so, so you've got to have more of your quality system in place than you do for the US and you have to have the go through the certification process um, and that that is that's an expensive cert okay so um you know the trend with 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 drugs and biologics right that that therapeutic class has has traditionally been that companies exit earlier they get they you know move into the strategic channel earlier because the the regulatory pathway and the final clinical trials are so expensive that they just can't go it alone right um how is I, this going to impact that um i have department? a conspiracy theory about how the mdr came to be it's oh. like a so it's a macroeconomic uh pro problem here um because, you know, the people who have the time and the resources to take the time and sit down with the regulators are, you know, what I call the one percenters. They're the really big con uh, companies that have got deep pockets and a lot of resources, and they use regulatory very strategically in acquisitions. And it used to be companies would be like, I'm, I need to go to the US, I need to go to EU, I need to do, I'll get all these, prove my market share, and that's going to increase my valuation, you know, when I exit. Well, now they can't afford to go to all these other markets. So it lowers their potential evaluation because they do have to have that strategic partner to do the trials to negotiate the testing, to, to wait out the notified body. I mean, just, it, you know, to tell an investor, I'm going to need two years likely just to get a certification to go into this market. You know, that's a, that, that's asking for a lot of money to sustain the company in that period of time. So, so with the, um, the notified bodies, right. And you said I had a client in Switzerland, right. Versus a client in the United States. 
Um, have you seen that there's any um, preferential treatment? I don't want to say most favored nations because that's that got a different legal connotation. But if it's a European country, company, or especially if it's in the same area as that notified body, um, other than the fact that they have perhaps relationships they've developed over time, is there an in-country advantage? There absolutely is. Um, and this is where I, I mentioned it's really important to understand the country in which your notified body is based and their language. Um, that client was in Switzerland, notified body in Germany. They both spoke German natively, even though the audit and all the findings are written in English, they talked in German. They emailed in German. They asked questions in German, and it is a very different than what was written on the paper in English. Like they could figure out what they really meant in their brains before they wrote it down in a different language. Um, they also said that culturally, um, you know, Switzerland and Germany are similar enough that they also understood, you know, kind of some of the, the innuendos that, that might be there as well. So. So in some countries, right, outside of Europe and inside of Europe, um, licensing relationships where you license your, your product to a, in, to a partner just for that country. Um, Japan, for instance, is, is notorious for licensing with a Japanese partner in order to get your product to market. Um, is, is that a strategy that can help with that in-country relationship challenge? You know, I, I don't think so, because that is independent of bringing of, of actually getting the CE mark. Okay. And so you're going to have to go through that that CE marking process the same regardless. I would say that, you know, it would be more important to get some sort of internal resource or um, or maybe hire a translator or something of that nature that, that could get you on the same page with your notified body. Okay. Right. That and might I be do. like a secret translator. Like, so, <laughs> so you're like, you show them, you show them the English and say, okay, they speak French natively. What did this mean? Yep. Um, I actually talked to uh, somebody who used to be, the head of one of the, the first couple of notified bodies to, to get uh, designated under MDR. And he said that the interpretation and the language issues are so significant that, that they were um, in their audit, they were three different competent authorities with three different native languages. And they at one point got in an argument over what the interpretation was because in their languages, everybody thought it meant something different. So, and he speaks four languages natively, and he says he can tell the way questions are written in English, who, what their, their, their native language is. So I see, um, you know, some of our, partners on the call who work very, very closely with our entrepreneurial community and, and help them navigate these processes. And very often they're talking to these companies before they even have a product, right? They're, they have an idea and they're just starting this process. Um, you had shown kind of on the timeline, you know, that it's really important to start early on your strategy. Um, with the universities, you know, are you having these converse conversations with the university tech transfer offices? Because a lot of times they're, you know, patenting and, and starting the clock on things. And then if you add all this timeline on your, your time's going to run out on your patent before you start to see any real revenue. Right. Yeah, um, I'm actually a, a mentor in residence at several um, incubators, which are kind of just that like it's just as something is like making it out of the university so it's still very early mm -hmm. um uh so so yeah but that is absolutely the right time to to ask those questions okay and you know as we've been looking at the different countries and we've you know we talked about germany a little bit and we've we've talked about some of the others um 
you know, is it is there one that's easier to navigate than others, or does it really depend on what you're doing? Sorry, my dog's having a moment over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> could you ask that again, please? Okay. So you know, we we've talked about you know various <laughs> countries. Is there is there one that's <laughs> easier than others? You know, not not right now. The because the competent authorities, like I said, it, it just rolls downhill. So and right now everybody's learning. And so there's no consistency to be had right now. I just did a major presentation for the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society and about, on all these early adopters. I could only find 15 people that responded to me about what their experience was. And um, that, and I put out like on huge forums. And then um, it, some of the largest market surveys that are out there right now from, from big industry groups, they only had like 96 people that responded. And some of them were just like, no, we're not trying. You know, and so there's just not a whole lot of experience out there to be had right now for lessons learned. So, Tom, you had a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond to um, Joan's remark about the, the need for this with our startup companies. Um, we see it all too often that they put it off just as you showed in that one slide to the last minute. Oh, I need an FDA expert because I have to submit my 510K next week. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've put together a, a three part you know, workshop on first understanding what that pathway is that they're going to have to follow. The, the, the second workshop deals with what are the resources, the QMS, the people that you need to bring together. And then finally, it's how to, uh, you as the leader, as the CEO, take responsibility and lead a quality effort within your company's the culture from the very beginning. Um, because we've seen too many cases where companies actually have to back up you know, a year or 18 months. And, and go at it again because they didn't put the, the proper steps in place. So um, your message is, is is dead on, right, Joan? For 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 the what our clients are seeing. You um, know, in, in the seven years I've been working in this bioscience incubator here, I have never seen anyone budget properly for the regulatory process if they budget for it at all in at this early stage. So thank you for your comments. Yeah. Um. The worst offenders, if you will, uh, for startups have been the software as a medical device where it's software only. And they will come to me and say, we're ready for you to write our 510K and we need to turn it in in two weeks or something ridiculous like that. And they have no documentation because it's a software product. They haven't followed 62304. They haven't followed any of the FDA guidance documents. They don't have like just a requirement specification. Like, not, like, and I'm like, what am I going to write a 510K off of? You know, like you have to turn in testing and whatnot, even for software products. So that, that's a good um, lead in. So there, there's a lot of, perception out there that well software doesn't have to go to the FDA so when does it and when doesn't it right that is a really tricky one um, because it's all based off of claims and for some of these particularly digital health products you may be everything from you know uh, general wellness which is under enforcement discretion to uh, uh, possibly a de novo depending on how your claims uh, grow, what your indications are, if you uh, move into a diagnosis space, um, all of those things. And, and that for software, I have found that it's really important to, for, to do the regulatory strategy very, very early because it really kind of helps focus what is a minimally viable product for you to get to market. And what if I bring my product to market and I don't have the approvals either through ignorance or some, for some other reason, and I'm and I get caught? Yeah, you get uh, a lovely letter from the FDA 
on the letterhead written by their lawyers uh, asking you to uh, cease and desist, uh, you know, sales of your product. They can ask you to recall your product or they can just ask that you to stop marketing it for that particular indication, depending on, on what, how egregious your violation is. So, you know, the, the indication trick question again gets tricky. Right. Because as we've especially seen during COVID, um, physicians have discretion. Right. So a physician may be using a product for a certain indication, but it's not an approved product for the, that indication. And the company cannot market for that indication, but it doesn't prevent the doctors from using it. Correct. They cannot regulate medical practice itself, but where it can get tricky is some of the startups that are either founded or co-founded or the phys practicing physician invented it. Then it, it gets to be like this little bit of a, a gray area if the person who's invented it is using it and then telling all their friends to use it. So it gets trickier and trickier and trickier. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, our, I think as we've been talking, we've been kind of like getting our entrepreneurs thinking um, ballpark numbers. And I know that every case is unique, but, you know, all in from, from concept to FDA approval, you know, what have you seen as a range for 510Ks? Um, you know, from just a fee perspective, for a small business, the FDA fee is around $3,000 for a 510K. And for a, you're, it, let's just say a class 2A, you kind of load moderate risk product for Europe um, that's going to require that notified body review. You're looking at... Um, no less than $100,000 in fees in, in fees for the first year, and then probably $150,000 over the course of three years for your recertification audits. Um, in terms of third party fees, it take it's probably in the ballpark of 20 to $30,000 to, you know, kind of consult hold hands you know, through the, write the submission through that whole process. And um, the, to write the technical file. Oh, that's another big difference under MDD versus MDR is the expectation for the clinical literature and clinical data. Just that piece, just that piece of the technical file takes 200 to 300 hours. And the qualifications that you have to have to perform that review are getting more and more stringent. Um, and the technical documentation takes another 200 to 300 hours. Oh, so, I mean, it's a, it, it is a massive undertaking. You're going to spend six figures on a proper clinical report. Okay. And then, you know, I have to do this in the U S I have to do this in the U S EU. Um, you know, some of the other large markets for these medical devices um, or tests are, um, you know, Japan, China, India, South Korea. You know, when you start looking at those highly populated countries, um, do you have to start all over again? Yes, they, um, most of those have got a separate approach clearance or approval process, depending on the country. Um, some of them have some uh, recognition programs to a point, um, like Australia. Um, but uh, one of the notified bodies I talked to recently said that um, Japan is wanting to see CE marking uh, and because they think that it, it means the product is safer. And he's like, no, it just means that there's more paper. You know, there's, it's not safer. You just wrote more, a bigger story about it. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely the, the perception out there in some of the Asian countries that the MDR adds some sort of 
imply some sort of safety or efficacy because it's so, so hard. So the the Chinese, okay, that can be a bit of a moving target mm -hmm. from a regulatory enforcement perspective. Um, just, it, but it's such a big market. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, can you share a little bit about if you're thinking about China as your, you know, next step? You know, the, those countries are, are particularly challenging because, you know, I can get on the FDA website, I can download the regulation, I can look at the product classification, I know I can figure out what they're going to expect. The Chinese have don't have a whole lot of form, like formality, they haven't published a lot, especially product specific things. And then they'll come out of the blue with some bizarre standard that you've never heard of that they want you to test your product to. So, so it's just, it's not very clear cut and it can make a difference, like who you talk to even, like, like they interpret and apply standards and expectations differently. Okay. So we are coming up on the end of our hour. And um, Michelle, any closing thoughts just to kind of wrap things up? Um, yeah, so if, you know, on the investor side, just if you're looking in the life science space, ask a lot of questions. Even if you don't know, like if, if they would just be blowing smoke, you know, with an answer, the story will start coming apart as you start asking questions, especially with just this little bit of education we've gone through here. And then if you're on the tech side, you know, put some time on my calendar and let's talk about where you're at and, and where you're at in that process and how it can be helpful and, you know, kind of save you, save you time and money or at least do a reality check on what you understand your strategy to be. Terrific. Well, with that, um, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today and, you know, getting this conversation started. Um, it obviously is not going to be an, the end of the conversation, um, but I think that for all of our companies, you've given them a lot to think about and also some really good pointers for our investors. So thank you for joining us today. Audience, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you have friends who were not able to join us today, we will be getting this online on the AZ Bio Peers page. And um, I should have that up for you um, before the end of the week. And just as a reminder, check you're in the loop and you'll have the link to the video pages. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great week and kudos, Michelle. Um, we're already getting comments on the chat of what a great presentation this was. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.